Welcome to another episode of Film and Impact, where we connect with indie filmmakers from around the world who are using documentary to move the needle. I'm your host, Stefan Roy, and today I'm speaking with an award-winning Iranian-American filmmaker and educator. She's an assistant professor at the Georgia State University, and she's currently working on a long-term project within migratory families in California. Today, we're going to be talking about art and activism, how we use documentaries to theorize and to process our realities, and just how documentary and the way we tell stories can work to maintain power dynamics. And she's also be going to talk into, she'll be talking to us also about her latest film, How to Tell a True Immigrant Story, which was the very first VR film to be programmed in the Pardi di Nomani Shorts Competition of the Locarno International Film Festival. It's really a pleasure for me to welcome today filmmaker and educator Aggie Ibrahimi Bazaz to speak with me on Film and Impact. Hey Aggie! Thank you. Hi. Today. Thank you so much for coming on uh, Film and Impact. I'm really happy to be talking with you for like a number of different reasons. I've had like the pleasure of seeing some of your work and also reading um, your articles on your work. Um, and this, you worked on a certain number of like themes that uh, I think so important, I'm thinking particularly on the question of immigration. But before I get into that, I just want to, um, I want to talk about that. But before I get into it, I want to welcome you to this episode of Film and Impact. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank you. It's the honor is really mine. I'm so grateful to be here. And um, I really, truly feel honored that, that you would reach out to me. Um, and um, thank my friend Amada who connected us. Um, and I'm just really so happy that you're doing this work, um, speaking to, to women of color from around the globe who are working in documentary to think about their relationship to, to documentary as an art form and as, an, as a site for activism as well. So thank you for doing this work. Okay, let's have a conversation. Uh, <laughs> talk, talking about like, um, documentary filmmaking. Let's start with how you got into filmmaking. Um, you, you came, you're now living in the US and you came to the US where like back in the 80s because you're from Iran and how did you like through your, your story and you know your journey get to documentary filmmaking and why? <laughs> well, I still wonder why sometimes. Um, I do know why. It was a really hard journey, I will say, because um, as an Iranian immigrant, there's really only a few acceptable professions in the Iranian diasporic community, potentially in Iran as well. And those professions are um, medicine, engineering, and law. And so to try to craft a career as an artist um, within the community was very difficult. I remember when I was around seven years old, I knew I wanted to be a writer and that was like my dream. And um, I started telling the Iranians around me and my mom, of course, who I adore and her friends and all her friends. And my mom loves my writing, but all her friends would say like, yeah, yeah, that's cool, but you gotta do something else and do that on the side. And so I spent a long time um, trying to preserve the dream while also satisfying the community. And so I did my undergraduate degree um, at, a, at Georgia Tech in the sciences. Um, I tried to go the medical route. I just wasn't interested. So I ended up with a bachelor's of science in psychology and research psychology, which was really cool. I learned a lot, but you know, my, I, I really wanted to be a writer. And so um, I somehow started, I somehow started to have this idea that maybe I would go into filmmaking. I had no idea why, but um, so it was like in the back of my head, but I didn't really pursue it because if I, I already felt really intimidated by writing as a craft and as a profession. But um, we, my mom and I traveled back to Iran in 2003 for the first time since we had left, for the first time since I had left. And I went with her and it really, um, it was a beautiful trip. It was difficult in some ways and really um, opened my eyes to sort of um, a, a deeper core self. And when we came back from that trip, I felt like, all right, I'm ready now to 
pursue the thing that I have felt called to pursue. And so I, I went into a master's program um, at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia, here in the Southeast in the US. Um, and I studied multicultural American literature and women's studies. And there I had the great fortune of working with two professors who transformed my life. Um, one was Judith Ortiz Kofer, a Puerto Rican writer who has now since passed, um, sadly. And she was, a, she was my creative writing instructor, essentially. And then another professor was Dr. Barbara McCaskill, an African-American woman. And she started a project called the Civil Rights Digital Library Initiative. And somehow she chose me as one of her research assistants in grad school. And my job was to scour hundreds of hours of archival news material from civil rights movement activities in the South and um, determine which ones we would want to digitize and put on a pedagogical website for K through 12 teachers to be able to expand how they teach about civil rights movement to move us beyond MLK, Rosa Parks, et cetera, and really think about the movement um, as a series of activities that lasted decades and um, were really nuanced. And so that to me, those two sort of trainings happening simultaneously, creative writing and digital media as a, as a space for raising consciousness and social justice, studying multicultural American literature, studying Toni Morrison, um, Maxine Hong Kingston, and really recognizing um, the power in telling one's story. Those two things together really birthed the, the idea of, um, I, what I would say is more, what, you know, in, in creative writing, I was interested in the genre of creative nonfiction. So poetic prose rooted in autobiography or some degree of truth, but um, with creative liberties. And, and that I wanted to pursue that genre in filmmaking. And that's when I um, completed my master's degree and then moved into an MFA at Temple University um, because they were really invested in um, telling stories from communities not typically featured in the dominant mainstream cinema. So it sort of was this, you know, roundabout way and it kind of, um, I kind of stumbled into it, I guess, but it really does fulfill my interest in the intersection of art and, and activism or maybe more like art and um, consciousness raising. I'm still thinking, why filmmaking? Like, you know, what interested you so much in filmmaking? Was this, was it that visual aspect? Did you feel like you needed to transpose your, your writing into something that you could, you know, see visually, um, that you could explore differently? Why? Yeah, yeah, I think it was definitely the visual aspect. Um, I remember going to the High Museum here in Atlanta and there was this um, photo, I think it's a standing exhibition, a photo um, exhibition of photos from the um, Birmingham Civil Rights Movement activities. And I just remember like the power of the, the impact that the visual image had on me was something that really sat with me. And at the time also I was, I was trying to tell the story of, of um, my aunt who's still in Iran and um, was in an abusive, terrible relationship with her husband at the time. Um, and he basically like leveraged the power of the patriarchal state to um, take her child away from her. And so I wanted to tell that story. And I remember as I was thinking about it, it was really a visual story in my mind. And I, and I felt like I wanted more tools than, than the page. Um, to me also, video editing, I often say this to my students, but it really feels to me like writing but with visual images and sound and just more tools. It is an act of writing, but with different tools. So I think that was what drew me is that the visual, the power of the visual image. Also, I think um, the reach of um, video media at the time felt a lot more um, potent than the reach of, of like a poet, for example. I don't think that's true anymore, thank goodness. And I think the, the culture has shifted, which is great. Um, but at the time I felt like maybe I could have more impact, maybe there's more emotions I can access through having this range of tools. Um, and then, you know, pragmatically, I was seeing that my peers, because I started a PhD in creative writing right after my master's, and then I switched to the MFA in film, and I was seeing that my really exceptionally talented peers in the PhD programs in creative writing weren't necessarily landing um, the tenure track jobs that they had hoped for in the academy to support their writing. So I thought, you know, again, I just, I think I need a little bit more, um, need some more tools in my toolkit in order to tell the stories I want to tell and be able to pull from those different tools per like from the different stories I'll be telling. Yeah. Um, you mentioned this story with your, your aunt and I saw that um, short film. Uh, oh, thank you. 
such a you know difficult situation to actually live and at the end there's no real resolution because um it ends up you know she says at the end of the the film that uh, she sort of stopped this contact that she had with her son you know she was seen um sort of secretly to give him poems um, she stopped doing that because at some point, either the child or the father, she could not remember which one, like, let her know that they did not want to receive that anymore. Um, it's, you know, it's a really difficult situation to live, and it brings me to the, an, another film that I saw of yours, um, How to Tell a True Immigrant Story. Um, there's also Inheritance that tells the story of your family. Mm -hmm. What brings you to make these uh, these films? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, um, I mean, each of them grow from such a different spark, um, or each of them are responding to a different need or a different urgency. Um, the story with my is there um, so maybe before I answer, like, do you feel like you is there something that you like, are you thinking about what draws me to these specific stories about maybe women or immigration, or do you mean like what drew me to each specific film? Um, I'm thinking what drew you to the, these, the all stories that are, there is a thread of immigration running through all of these because, for example, the story of your, of your aunt, you, you're telling the story from the perspective of someone who's left your country for years and you're looking back in and telling the story of what she's living there with the patriarchal system that's in place, that very unjust um, system. And how to tell a true immigrant story, there we're in a completely different space because it's a 360 virtual reality experience. Um, inheritance, it's a, a, a love experience again with family archives and you know uh, images of your family um, telling this sort of story an uh, intergenerational story that you are also included where we have your perspective and your voice but that as well of your mother your grandmother and so there is the thread of immigration running through them but there's also something that's very very personal i think in all of the in all of the stories mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say that's true. Um, yeah, it's a really good question. I mean, I think of my one of my students, Josh Cleveland, who's a filmmaker. He often says like he's 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 looking to tell the most honest story that's possible, or to make it to make the most honest work that he can. And I think that for me, um, honest, I'm that I'm I think I'm striving for that too. Maybe that there's something honest about um, that I want to portray honestly the relationships that go into those films, right? So like with my aunt, it was about like, I am the person receiving the story. And so much of that story is about the fact that she is alone, sort of locked away in a country in which divorce is stigmatized. So there's not really anyone that she can speak to. So the, the, the connection across overseas is actually important to sort of creating the, the cultural element or the context in which the story is unfolding. Um, so I think there's that element. I also think that um, I, so, yeah, so I'm interested in relationships and I, I think a lot of my work grows out of the relationship between myself and the people with whom I'm, I'm working. And another one of my students, um, Emery Newman, he says, you know, that that's the most, that's the most honest documentary is the documentary that will acknowledge the presence of the filmmaker in whatever way, um, whether that's in editing or being on camera. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, I am really still, and I don't know the answer to this, but like, I'm really fascinated by creative nonfiction, like by sort of drawing from our own wells um, and, and telling stories that are uh, artistic, but based in real life. And I think on some personal level, it is, it's a way of processing. I, I really see documentary for me now, this late, like this far in, um, as a mode of not just like psychological processing, but kind of theorizing, you know, like thinking through something. So let's think through what it might be, uh, the experience of being um, my aunt and myself in this relationship across the seas, trying to understand the gravity of this 
horrifying story? How, how do we even like work through that? You know, what's an aesthetic that will allow us to work through that? Or like, let me theorize about the, the ways in which political circumstances so extreme, like um, total revolution of a system and, and complete, you know, overhaul of a system, how that actually has ripple effects that not only affect a family in the moment, but that continue to affect us years down the road. So like, to me, that's an act of theorizing around the relationship of the political to the personal and, and adding nuance to it, you know, like adding some complexity or depth that maybe we aren't already talking about. Similarly, how to tell a true immigrant story is most deaf. It's like, I think so far it's the most um, like actualized form of my theorizing using documentary to theorize, you know, around like representation and identity and how we think about immigration at all. So I think there's something in, and again, like, I'm not sure why I draw from personal experience. I do, I still do it in my writing, but um, it, uh, yeah, I, I think it has something to do with honesty and it has something to do with relationality. And tell me a little bit about that title, How Does a True Immigrant Story? Yeah. <laughs> like, first time I saw it, it just jumped out at me. And like it through the, the experience of that I absolutely love the, the VR experience, I felt it was so powerful, these uh, this sort of um, the collage of moments and experiences of like just passing through people's lives that were, you know, sort of like blending into each other. Um, I that was the first question I wanted to ask you when I saw this. I was like, tell me about this, how to tell a true immigrant. <laughs> As an immigrant myself, I'm like, I want to know. Right. So it grows out of two, um, well, it grows out of a lot, but I'll try to be short. Um, the, so the film grew out of a kind of a, um, a commission, essentially. We were part of this national cohort called the, um, well, rooted in the Brookline Interactive Group's Public VR Lab, which is based in Massachusetts. And they wanted to train media makers and local groups and public access stations around the country to teach community members to make VR because it's otherwise a very inaccessible medium. So um, the idea was like, let's train people to use VR so that we democratize the medium, but, in the, but we want to do that in a way that tells immigrant stories so as to um, try to intervene in the rampant xenophobia that is in the anti-immigrant sentiment that um, came to a head in 2016 had already existed but obviously like became much more mainstream in um after the election here so um when so i was like really thrilled to be part of that project but there was something about it for me about the framework which is um there's this great book called undoing border imperialism oh i have it right here by harsha walia and uh and i don't know i don't know harsha's gender identity but in undoing border imperialism they they talk about um the ways in which much of the work that we do to um, tell immigrant stories is assimilationist, you know, like to make palatable the immigrant to white liberal sensibilities, so as to, you know, like the sort of, hey, they're just like us narrative, you know, like they're not criminals, they're hard workers, that sort of um, benevolence that um, is, and charity, you know, it comes from, for me, it comes from like a sort of a charity mindset that, um, we want to we want to show you the ways in which the immigrant and the object is is not to be feared, you know. Um, and I just that sits very uncomfortably with me because it does not challenge the power dynamics, right? It maintains those same power dynamics. White liberal sensibilities are mainstream, and everyone else has to sort of like um, accommodate themselves to it in order to be accepted or what Trinity Minha calls incorporated and admitted, right? So to me, um, I started to wonder like, what is an immigrant story and what's an immigrant, you know, who gets to say, and why is it so important that we categorize people that way? So partly the, the title is entirely, um, uh, I would say ironic in a way, right? That it, it doesn't, it's not intending to suggest that there is a true immigrant story, um, but it is also trying to say like, well, if you're gonna tell an immigrant story, Here's other ways you could do it, you know, which entirely resist the categorizations and um, and flow and you know and create community and flow and chorus 
Um, and, and that don't start from these questions of like, who are you? Why are you here? Where did you come from? Which again, you know, um, as Trinity Minha says, like those are really meant to um, control the immigrant body. And so I'm not, um, so, I, so there's that. The other thing is, it's, it, um, again, back to my interest in creative nonfiction, it grows out of, um, it's an homage to Tim, o, Tim O'Brien's short story or essay, um, How to Tell a True War Story, in which he, um, are you familiar? No, uh, I, I actually discovered it when, from your piece. From wow. Your, yes. <laughs> That's so cool. That's so cool. Yeah, and in that, you know, he's really thinking through, like, how do you even tell a war story when the horrors of war are unbelievable, right? Like, how, what, how do we make a credible war story? So I was just really interested in his, um, again, theorizing around, like, the, yeah, around credibility of war for those who have never lived it. And so, so that essay too is about like translating an experience from those who have lived it to those who have not. And I was thinking, you know, that's exactly what we're doing in documentaries about immigrants often, you know, like translating an experience for the sort of um, white mainstream audience. And I pull from that too, from Jill Godmelow's writings around like the liberal documentary. And so I was sort of, these ideas were swimming around um, as I came up with the title. Do you feel like, you know, as you're creating these documentaries, like there's a part of you that's in each of these stories. Like when I think of an inheritance, that was a very personal story. Um, you talk about being haunted, for example. Do you feel like there's something that, like you might want to explain that, but do you feel like there's something that you might be uh, like searching for or um, something that you're trying to respond to uh, that you don't have the answer yet, even if inheritance, like, you know, that was a ways back. <laughs> but like how much of yourself do you feel like as maybe an immigrant also, and you're telling the stories that it's like infused within the, the stories that you're telling? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways I'm responding to white supremacy, you know, like the, the ways in which it um, has limited the conversation and, and limited it to its own terms, right? So that the ways in which it renders invisible, it simplifies, it categorizes, it controls, um, and the ways in which it, um, yeah, like reduces complexity. So I think in some ways I'm responding to that and I'm responding to that because I lived it. I grew up with my, you know, my mom was amazing, a single mother here in the US and she raised us um, in spaces in which, you know, like we had really great education in some regards, but then like I didn't learn anything about identity and power and the ways in which those were shaping my own experience. I mean, I'm white passing, but I still felt um, othered in a lot of ways culturally. So um, I, um, and then, you know, my family isn't, isn't white passing. So there's those complexities as well. Like the, so um, I think that those wounds of living in a space that was clearly not designed for me um, and, and wasn't super accepting of me and consistently like, um, saw me as something that it had to, again, assimilate and try to, you know, um, shape into its own image in order to be able to accept me. That feeling and that wound, um, I think, continues to, to haunt the pieces, you know. So, like, my aim is to really try to expand the conversation, like, write more experiences into the public dialogue um, and different and differently, you know, like, use different types of aesthetics and forms so as to, again, expand how we think about ourselves and how we think about one another. And I say another sort of thing I'm responding to is patriarchy because that is a sort of um, the, the ways in which um, women have been limited and um, it, at least in my family, it's women. It, it has not been gender non-binary people, but also gender non-binary people, queer people, like the ways in which these systems really, um, yeah, limit our experience, heteronormative systems, um, ableist systems, just, yeah, like the ways in which they reduce our fullest expression. I felt that and I don't want other people to feel that and I wanna sort of expand the conversation so that we can um, fully express, right? And, and, and feel like there's place for us. Um, do you feel like your films have, or maybe haven't made these like documentaries, like it's impacted in some way your family's viewpoint of you or of themselves? Like, 
from the time you started actually making films and maybe they started seeing themselves in um, on screen do you feel like it has like anything has shifted like it has changed anything um that's a great question i don't know they've never said if it has or hasn't um i and it's i guess it's not something we talk about um because it's still sort of a sore subject as to like whether i even belong in that like whether i belong in documentary is a sore subject and whether i um whether I should be doing this work because like I would have had an easier life if I had just gone to like law school. You know what I mean? It's still not something that we like have really accepted and, and um, can celebrate. But I think um, my family has come a long way and they've been very, very, very supportive. Um, but I don't, yeah, we, it's not something, it's a great question. And I think it's one that I would like to ask them um, or at least start looking out for like, but then, you know, I do think that like it's affected me and I've grown through the process so much. So I, I think that no matter what, like when one person grows within a relational network, the dynamics change somehow, you know, no matter what. So I think there has to have been some kind of change. I just, I, it would be interesting to hear um, my family members reflect on it back to me. And I, that's a really cool question. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's really interesting how all family sometimes relate to us like um, as visual storytellers um for example when i think of <laughs> i've often filmed my grandmother uh, along with uh, my partner uh, stephanie who's behind the camera and you know oftentimes when we like go to film her like i try to capture her because i know that she's a great storyteller and there's so many things that she shares and i feel like oh my god at some point she will no longer be here and if i can get her on tape like i'm gonna have this you know like in the years to come and she's often like like stop telling me i i, I saw your mom and in the in the film inheritance when she came through the door and like you know you there's this still shot of the um the door the hallway and she comes in and then she realizes that you're there and she's like 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 don't film me you know like look like this um my grandma like she'd say the same thing she would be like like come on stop filming me and she's like oh you're always filming um and sometimes she gets annoyed and she makes like monkey faces etc and there was one moment where we would do, we were making a, a short film and we really wanted to to film her telling it a, a story because um that she had already started telling and she was like just not having it and she actually we actually stopped because we're like okay we're not gonna bother you and my little net my little cousin um she came back to us like maybe a day or two later and she's like okay if you want to film come on let's do it <laughs> so we're like okay thank you so much she's like we, we ran literally to go do it and she said it's your your little cousin who's he was i think like maybe 10 11 at the time she's like he told me like come on mommy you know help him out like you know, do it, do it for them. So I, I, I feel like um, there are times when the work that you do, even if like your family, like they don't completely understand why it is that you do what you do, um, and they don't necessarily see like the impact or the reach of it, or you know, what it's going to bring in the grand like scheme of things. Um, it does. Oh, it can it can have the that effect of like having like you know little changes or little shifts where they're gonna like accommodate you in order to either help you out because you're just you or they might understand to a small measure like okay this might be this is important in some way even if i don't know exactly just how important or just why it's this important for them you know so that's I, I feel like it does have an impact sometimes, even if it's like in a very small way. Um, do they ask you like, what are you gonna do with this? Or where is it gonna, like, I don't know, do they wonder, like, are they hoping that it goes somewhere and like, I don't know, goes to theaters and makes money? Or are they like, do they ever have like an outcome that they hope for, for the pieces that you do with them or the interviews that you film? No. <laughs> um, um, and that was like, like uh, my family's like really they're very very supportive um whatever like i do they're like 
okay, if you're doing it, there must be a reason. If, even if we don't really understand the reason, even if sometimes it's like quite annoying to us that you're there with a camera. Um, but we accept like, so when I tell them this film actually went to this festival and they're like, oh, wow, that's amazing. And if I tell them like, you know, we screened the film in a school, they're like just as excited. <laughs> That's awesome. They basically, just like support it, like in whatever form. So if it's online and like I share it, they're like super excited, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a good point. I mean, I think I would say my family's the same, but I'm realizing that I've internalized the sort of um, the, the messages from the world around like if the film goes here, didn't make a splash, not worthwhile, it needs to go here to like be a worthwhile pursuit, you know, but I think I'm, I'm realizing as you're speaking that like even just at, sitting down and asking one's grandmother a series of questions and maybe there's an audio recorder, maybe there's not and you're just taking notes, whatever it is, like that act of creating space for hearing and receiving story, for honoring a story and a history, that even if that doesn't transform a family's dynamic, it does add something, it grows something, you know, it is a positive experience. It can be really meaningful. It grows the bond no matter what, you know, and I think um, it's really a valuable moment. And so like that doesn't necessarily have to go somewhere like to some prestige thing in order to be valuable, but it's so hard in the field, in the, in the industry, to not feel like, um, to shut off those voices, you know what I mean? And to really be focused on like the, the power within the relationship of the storytelling as opposed to um, the prestige of distributing that storytelling in the world beyond, you know? That's definitely, and I think it's a really, really good point because I think it's something that um, limits us as storytellers sometimes often when we start off because we often think, feel that because we've internalized it because we've seen it you know from the outside that your film has to be on a certain platform in order for it to be considered a successful film it has to make a splash somewhere it has mm -hmm. to be uh, if it's online it has to be viral um, there has to be like a claim you know, um, it has to trail behind it like a string of laurels from prestigious festivals. It cannot just be like this festival that way. It has to be like the ones, you know? And I think sometimes we don't even want to put out certain stories because we feel like, you know, it's not going to be good enough because it's not going to, it wasn't accepted maybe there. So we're not going to even like, put it out for people to see because if it wasn't good enough there, then it's not worth it. It's not worth anything. It's not worth putting out. And I think it is a shame. It's something that does definitely limit us uh, because we compare how we rate like our worth as storytellers or the worth of what it is that we create against some sort of benchmark that is so arbitrary and created by people that we don't even know who they are, you know, and they definitely do not know our stories and they definitely don't know why we're telling them or the importance of them. So I, that is definitely something that is so, so very important. And I'm really happy that we have tools and media that allow us to share our stories in very different ways. So there's so many different ways that exist for storytellers and filmmakers to be able to um, share the stories and also collaborate in different ways. I mean, you've like, the, the story, How to Tell a True Immigrant Story is an example of that, how storytellers um, collaborate. Um, in this film, there's, um, there's poetry, there's 360 VR, you have different um, persons from like different artistic fields like working together telling these stories, but you also have the platforms on which these stories can be broadcast. So yes, you do have television and the cinema and you have festivals, but you also have um, online media. Uh, you have ways of directly reaching people who need to see your films, who need to see your stories, who need to see themselves, you know, and who need to see themselves differently, as you're saying, 
not in a way that's diluted, where the story is diluted and they, the representation of themselves is um, glossed over to fit um, or to make somebody else feel less fearful or so that it looks like somebody else, you know, like, hey, I'm not so different from you in, you know, um, yeah, so thank you for, for talking about that. Yeah. Um, tell me a, a little bit about your, there's, the, there's another film that I did not see the film. I haven't seen the film yet, but it's the, like I said, the Mama Icha, is it Mama Icha's house? And this is one that you're producing. And it's, I, why this story is like, it really touched me when I saw the, I saw the trailer. So I'm not even sure if it's like actually out yet or, you know, uh, it's a story of this woman who's, she left Colombia like years and years ago and she's now an elderly woman and she actually saved money, built her house back in Colombia and all she wants to do is go back home because we, there's this tie that links us to the homeland, to the motherland that's like an umbilical cord and there's something that's calling. So she fights to go back home and she ends up going back home. And then when she gets back, we see that in the beginning, it seems to be like, you know, a joyous reunion. And then from there, it's sort of, you have like the family issues and the, the problems with the house that's deteriorating and bills to pay and the, the son who seems to be in, in trouble all the time and clashes within the family. And that's like, the, the other side of the coin, you know, the immigrant story where you, you go to another country to make a better life and some people go back home, but when you go back home, it's not always the joy of just finding your, your home, you know, that's linked to like the memories also that you had of that place. There's like the harsh reality of time that has passed by and people's lives that have continued and difficulties that you have to deal with, that you did not live there with them. So tell, can you tell me a little bit about this, uh, that project? Wow, I mean, I, there's not so much more I can add from what your incredibly deep and generous read. So thank you for all the time you've invested in, in watching the various pieces. Um, yeah, Mama Icha's House is completed and it's directed by Oscar Molina, who is a Colombian filmmaker. And he started the film when he was living in Philadelphia. We were at Temple University together in grad school. Um, and he met Mama Icha and um, started to sort of film with her and um, she had made up her mind that in her 90s she was gonna like you said go back and live in her um, the house she had built with remittances um, and her family tried to the family in the US really didn't want her to go because of the social services here in the US and um, health care and and they were really taking great care of her the family here so they were really worried about her but she was determined because like you said of that tie to the homeland um, and, and, and that doesn't have to be another country. It could be like another town, you know, it's just home, whatever feels like home and that, that mysterious connection we have to it. Um, and so she went back and Oscar was the person that she invited to go with her. So he accompanied her on the return trip, both as a, um, as a friend and as a filmmaker. And so they went together and he made the film over the course of four years. It took about two years to finish the edit, I think. Um, and it premiered this year at Cartagena in Colombia, which is really big, but unfortunately Oscar screening time was maybe two hours after Cartagena canceled because of COVID. So Cartagena ran the first couple of days, but then um, the country started to really, uh, I mean, everything started to blow up and so they, closed down the festival the same Friday that Oscar was um, premiering. He did end up screening, but to a much smaller audience to about, they would only allow about 50 people in like a, in a theater of 200 or 250. So um, it didn't, it didn't have the kind of premiere feeling that he would have liked and that the film deserved. And um, it does have theatrical release in Colombia and it was meant to go um, to premiere in theaters throughout the country this past May, but again, because of COVID, everything has been delayed. Um, but that's another film which has been the result of 
years of effort, um, really beautiful composition, really sensitive storytelling, um, someone who is so deeply embedded in the story of, of a person whose life might have never really um, had a lot of, you know, we might not be discussing Mama Icha if, if Oscar's filmmaking hadn't given us a reason to. I will say her granddaughter is an incredibly talented visual artist, Michelle Angela Ortiz, who's based in Philadelphia. And so she does a lot of paintings of her grandmother. So we would have learned about her one way or another. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a story that I feel like is, is really valuable and raises a lot of important conversations, but um, uh, hasn't had yet because of COVID and be I think also because of its subject matter, maybe, I don't know, but um, hasn't yet had the, the, the sort of um, major world festival circuit that we would have hoped for it, especially given the amount of work that went into it. Um, but it has had a really strong uh, sense of support in across Latin America and um, in Mexico and Colombia. Um, and so that's good. And then Oscar is now working on finishing a film about, um, about that same thematic of people who build homes from their adopted country, build homes from there using their earnings in their home country, they build the home. And then they sort of have this dream of returning to that home they built just like Mama Icha. But, um, you know, Oscar's interested in like whether that dream is ever fulfilled. And like you said, how is it fulfilled? You know, even if you get to go back, does it really line up with your expectations? So La Casa de Mama Icha is a sort of like deep character driven look into that experience. And then um, the next film, which will be um, The Absentee's House is a more sort of uh, survey of that experience, like less character driven and more vignette driven. It's really beautiful as well. Oh, I would love to see both. Thank you. Both Thank films. you so much. Um, Thank you. It's really an experience that I feel like touches me a lot because I live in another country where I'm very, very connected to my home country. Um, I was actually having a conversation with um, somebody yesterday and we were talking about traveling and she asked me, you know, okay, of all the countries that you've traveled to, like we were listing countries that we've traveled and she's like, of, of all the countries you've traveled to, which country would you choose to live in? And I was like, Dominica, mm. that's my that's my home country. <laughs> like, so of course, like you know, we laugh. But I, I said, I would not choose another country to live in because I I feel so very strongly connected to my country that definitely this would be the place that I would see myself like living um, in like all ideal situations. Um, so I feel like really connected to these stories um, that you're you're telling, and um, I remember in in um, how to tell a true immigrant story. Th there was one um, thing that one of the persons in the film said that really struck me, and it did make me remember something that you told me when we spoke for the first time. He said, people call me by different names. And I, I saw in, in an article that you'd written afterwards that, you know, this sort of work became like a sort of foundation um, for, the, for the film. And it reminded me of something that you told me when, you, when we first spoke, which was that Aggie wasn't your first given name. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, your name had been transformed um, so it would be easier for like Americans to pronounce. Um, I think that it's, this is so powerful for me in terms of just how this touches on the essence of who you are because your, your name and how you're called, it's so connected to um, the person that you are, the construct that you also build of yourself as a person. Um, th this phrase, people call me by different names, I felt like it said so much. It said so much about how people relate to the person that they see in front of them, but also how the person themselves, they relate to their own self. And there was, of course, another, another aspect of it, you know, that was a bit more subtle in the, um, the possibility of the person themselves creating these like different spaces for themselves to exist as a as an immigrant in a new place etc 
Um, but like I did, I did want to talk to you about that because this was something that like struck me. Um, if why was this so important for you, like this phrase that it be mm. the foundation of the of the film or one mm. of the foundations at least? Yeah, no, I mean it's also like typically when I talk about the film, uh, we have a series of T-shirts, and and that is the statement on the T-shirt. Like people call me by different names, and it has a list of all of the people who participated. Um, didn't do it today because I didn't know how much that film would be central to the conversation. But it is, it is. You really picked up on how um, foundational it is as a, as an idea. Um, and I think what everything you're saying is so right. And, and it, what's interesting is, you know, it, that terminology conveys, or that one statement conveys so much. It conveys the sort of the power dynamic of of an immigrant's experience can be, or a person who is new to a country that, like, you know. Um, other people get to sort of decide how they want to refer to me, right? And then I get to decide, like, what am I going to do in response to that, right? So it is about, like, power. Um, and then it is about, like you said, um, the agency of self-definition. And so, you know, if, if we know that in this space I'm going to be called by whatever, you know, you're comfortable with, um, then what am I going to do with that? You know, like, how am I going to use that as a personal power? Or how am I going to assert my own name? You know what I mean? Like, what's my response to that going to be? And I think um, what I like about what we tried to do in the film is to sort of say, like, well, you can call me whatever you want, and then I'm going to use that, right? Like, I'm going to be... Um, I'm not going to allow you to pin me down and categorize me and put me into these sort of... Um, boxes that the system demands and requires, you know, like I'm going to be the many different names and I'm going to be a collective and I'm going to operate um, through the, 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 I'm going to assert my right to constantly be evolving and changing and not have to be sort of um, locked into a perception that makes you comfortable and makes dominant culture comfortable. You know what I mean? So I think um, there's something really radical or resistant in being able to say like you can call me whatever you want and I will um but I still have like an agency in, in self-identification and how I'm going to respond to that um but yeah I mean so much is lost too and that's the other thing like I know for my mom my name in Farsi is really unique like it's not one that people typically name their children and so she's lost 30 something years of being able to really say that name in public and hear people say like, what a beautiful name, you know, how'd you come up with it? What does it mean? Like all of that, that um, cultural conversation that comes up around my name in Iran, she, it just went away for her, you know, and she's had to sort of um, allow for me to just have this like, yeah, this other name, which is cute, but it doesn't have the same like gravitas. Similarly, like my brother's name is Ali and he, um, well, sorry, his name is Ali, but in the U.S. they call him Ali, and that's another thing, too, like, just the ways in which, like, we have to relate to him differently based on, you know, so, um, yeah, so I think, like, there's just so much about identity and power and self-definition in that, and then also about, like, the individual versus the collective, or not versus, but, like, as part of a collective. Well, like, I haven't had a, a name change, but, you know, the example of your brother, for example, um, who the pronunciation of the name is different and it changes how you relate to it, the sonority, you know, what you hear. Um, mm -hmm. the, I, I don't know if it's like the, the sound waves that are different. So it, it conveys something different when you hear your name. So my name in English is like just pronounced Zephyrin. And in French, people say Zephyrin. So it gives it this, um, <laughs> it gives it something that's, a bit more like softer and the way that it's said, it just changes, I think, the sort of gives like a different image of the person. It's really very strange. So for quite a while, I tried to get people to say Zephyrin. <laughs> like I would tell them how to place like a different French accent on the E to make it sound like, you know, it would normally sound, you know, like the original name, but I realized that it was sort of like a, a losing battle. Like it was just difficult for, for people. So like, you know, afterwards I like, I let that go. Um, but I definitely like relate to that, how um, the, the name is like so important. And 
it's the first one of the first things that the first ways that we relate to, to people you know apart from like the visual aspect when we see people how we engage with them we engage with them through the name the way we we call them and that name carries like so much it carries especially for people who've migrated it carries like the weight of all of your yourself and your history and your, your story and where you've come from and so uh, your, your like your family life like everything you know you carry that with you like in your name so i feel uh, maybe as a child uh, if the name change i guess occurs like before it's less um it has less of a, a punch maybe because you probably grow up with like these two names or you're sort of like fine you know with it so it's easier to, to accept than maybe if you come across like as uh, somebody in your 30s and um you sort of lose your name you know you lose like piece of your piece of yourself um so i think that coming back a bit to the you know maybe the role of of documentary because when i saw how many of like your films were on these themes centered around like you know um immigration and and power and uh, i feel like there's a, also the question of um reclaiming or restructuring uh, the one's own narrative um i remember remember seeing in one of your pieces the term narrative sovereignty uh, which that was the first time I, I was seeing the, this term. Um, you might like explain that a bit. Um, I was really intrigued uh, because I, uh, I felt there is a statement, a very loud and powerful statement that says through storytelling and documentary, I'm here to do work. <laughs> to do some like form of work like it's very very concrete um it's breaking down barriers breaking down constructs and rebuilding something like from a new from a fresh yeah i absolutely agree with you and i think that's um that is the work that is part of the work to be done um and you know as an iranian in the u.s like iran is such a target of uh of like u.s sort of cultural um i don't know what like it's a it's a it's an enemy basically culturally like even if we're not directly in militaristic war with iran iran is symbolically an enemy to the united states and and for the past 40 years since the revolution has been um portrayed one way or another in the media in these very simplistic ways um, that, and violent ways, you know what I mean? So, um, and as, as an antagonist to the United States, as the opposite of everything the U.S. stands for, even though that is increasingly less true, um, as the United States sort of veers into its own theocratic autocracy. So I think, um, it, to me, there is a need to write ourselves anew, um, and there's a need within the Iranian community to do that. So like, one, you know, we need to write ourselves into the cultural landscape as Iranians, but then also within Iranian community, we need to expand the possibilities of what it what it means to be Iranian, and that can include like being a struggling filmmaker who isn't a doctor, you know. So um, there is that. Um, there's a scene in a film I'm working on now uh, with this young man who is Mexican. He he and his family travel back and forth to the United States every year. And in one of those years of travel, he was in AP Spanish. And the first day of class, the teacher had all of the students write their names on the wall and like a little bit about themselves. But because he was migrating and is forced to migrate due to some state policies, um, he missed that day in class. So his name wasn't on the board. And so that to me is like the symbolism of what our work is, you know, that like, and so in one scene we have Jose like stand and sort of tell us what he would have written if he was on the board or if he had been there that day. And so that's the work, right? Like write yourself back into the wall, which has moved on without you, which has rendered you invisible um, and which didn't create space for you even after like you came back, you know, and, and your absence itself was part of systemic forces, right? Like it wasn't just like you chose not to be there that day. The system made you absent. Legislation thing for the, the families who work on the farms. 
Exactly. That's exactly right. Right. So yeah, for farm working families in this particular housing system, they're required to move every year and they can't come back until the school year has already started. So he misses these days and, um, and yeah, and therefore it's like not, his presence is not known, right? Even though he's a U.S. citizen. So I think, um, and citizenship aside, even if he wasn't, um, there, that is what, you know, we do that so often in different ways is, um, is render invisible. And then it's like, okay, well then, you know, one antidote to that has typically been representation. So then just like put more bodies on the screen of color. But to me, that's not quite enough because that typically doesn't, um, that typically might come through like the same ideologies and same power structures as before, right? Which is like that sort of assimilationist narrative um, or it um, is tokenizing and therefore like sort of more caricature than complex or character, you know? So I think um, the, the work is like write a space for ourselves, but also make sure that the space is fluid and expansive and open and, com and, and privileges complexity and consciousness, you know, and, um, and like an ever going journey to like, to grow in our understanding of ourselves and, and each other. Um, rather than in sort of like a more categorical um, tokenizing way. So yeah, I think um, that all is really, as you said, like really important and is the work of documentary. Oh, wow. Well, or well, can be anyway. <laughs> thank you so much <laughs> for the work that you do. Oh my gosh, thank um, you. Yeah, I'm really, really happy to, that I was able to connect with you. Um, I feel like there's, you know, there's so much more work that we have to do, but I think that connecting is really an important part of that work, that we're aware also of the other people who are out there who are in their own ways doing the work. Um, so thank you so much for doing that and for connecting with me. Oh my gosh, Zephyrin, thank you for the deep, deep dive into the work. It's really quite an incredible gift to me that you would take time to do that. And not just to me, but to everybody I've worked with who, who's wanted to share their stories. So um, thank you for doing that and for such um, really thoughtful approach to the material. Uh, yeah, it's incredible that, that you're willing. And I hope that I can um, dive as thoughtfully into your work and be able to continue the conversation with you. Um, narrative sovereignty as a concept, I'll send you a link. There's a, a beautiful set of protocols that came out by um, indigenous media makers in Canada um, in a group called Imagine Native. And I learned about them through my colleague, Liz Miller. So I'll send you a link to that. It's really um, just a, a, a powerful expression of, um, of the sovereignty of, of indigenous peoples to tell their own stories through their own techniques and sort of, um, and then how like others can be allies toward that. Oh, please, please do. I'm really, I'm really interested in this because um, I saw that, I saw that, um, that Did I, lose you? I saw the, uh, the project, uh, and I love the name, um, Imagine Native, and because, you know, I'm from the island of Dominica, and Dominica is home to the largest and last population of indigenous people from the Caribbean. So they were originally Amerindians from the, the, the South of America and they migrated to the, the Caribbean. And, you know, with the coming of the Europeans, they were um, exterminated throughout the Caribbean um, chain of islands. And so Dom in Dominica, we have the largest population of mm -hmm. original peoples and who were for years stigmatized and uh, marginalized. Uh, so I'm really very interested in uh, concepts and tools that speak to all, all, you know, ways in which these people who were the foundation who allowed us to be here today, especially talking about like my history personally, because they were very uh, resistant. Um, you know, they were fighters. They also helped uh, enslaved persons, the Maroons who ran away, they helped them, like they would hide them or they would um, cooperate with them, you know. So they created um, a base for us that is part of the resilience that we have today as a people in Dominica. So I'm um, really interested in concepts like this that, um, that allow us to create tools for these like original people to 
I'm also part of Kalinago. Like, you know, I have this in my blood. And we create or recreate our own narratives, our own story, and like reclaim like that space that is ours. I'm, I'm speaking. Wow. Like, I had no idea. Yeah, for the, <laughs> the Kalinago, yeah. So I'm so happy that I had this conversation with you. Um, there were so many things that I wanted to talk about and it was amazing. Thank you so much, Ivy, for being with me today. 